Good evening. My name is Chrissy and I would like to welcome you to the Doylestown Bookshop's virtual event series. We are thrilled to welcome award-winning author Denny S. Bryce as we discuss In the Face of the Sun, a new historical fiction novel that takes place during the height of the civil rights movement and follows the extraordinary journey of two women as they make their way, their way cross-country to confront a decades-old mystery from 1920s Black Hollywood. We will be in conversation for about 30 minutes. Following that, we will take questions from you, the viewers. If you would like to submit a question, click on Ask a Question on your screen and submit your questions there. If you're watching from a phone or tablet, click the icon with the question mark. If you would like to purchase this book from the Doylestown or Lahaska Bookshops, click the button on your screen that says Buy the Book. Now a little bit about our guest. Denny S. Bryce is the award-winning author of historical fiction novels including Wild Women and the Blues and In the Face of the Sun. A former professional dancer and public relations professional, she is now an adjunct professor in the MFA program at Drexel University, a book mm -hmm. critic for NPR, and a freelance writer whose work has been published in USA Today, Harper's Bazaar, and Frolic Media. She is also a member of the Historical Novel Society, Women's Fiction Writer, Writers Association and Tall Poppy Writers. Hi, Denny. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate being here and talking about my sophomore novel. That means novel <laughs> number two on the laundry list, hopefully laundry list, of novels that I will be writing and continuing to write for a few years ahead, you know, a few decades, hopefully, out here we sure in the hope world. So. Of yeah, yeah, it's a fun thing. So I was I was very lucky to get a galley of the book. I'm looking forward to getting into it this weekend. And as I was paging through it, I started thinking and wondering where did the idea for this book come from? Well, I I do have a good story for it. Um, the idea actually originated when I was in Los Angeles in 2017. In 2017, I, I used to do a lot of traveling uh, pre-pandemic have not gotten back on the road as much since, but intend to change that very soon. But in 2017, I was attending the Los Angeles Film Festival. That takes place, or took place, I think it still does when it happens, in Culver City. And there's a fabulous hotel in Culver City called the Culver Hotel, one of my favorites. I've been stayed there on a number of occasions. It's a very old hotel. It opened, I believe, in 1921, 22, something like that. And then on the second floor of this hotel, they have this sort of little history museum room. And as I was, you know, just rifling through that room, checking out the past and how, you know, whatever happened with this hotel, there was a little passage about a hotel called the Hotel Somerville. And it was on Central Avenue and 41st Street. I never heard of it. And I just started... I was fascinated because the thing about this hotel was that it was uh, the first luxury hotel in Los Angeles for African Americans only and uh, and built by African Americans, a dentist and his dentist wife, Dr. John Somerville and his wife, v Veda. And um it was also financed by the African-American community. It opened in 1928. So I said, wow, I'd never heard of it. And, and the significance of course, is that African-Americans during the 1920s and years after that, decades after that, could not register to stay at a hotel in Los Angeles, not at the Beverly Hilton. Well, I don't know if it was the Hilton then, but the, the luxury hotels in LA did not allow African Americans to register. So this hotel fascinated me because I'm an old hotel buff anyway. And then I started digging into its history and it was fascinating. And I said, I got to set something there. Um, so um, I'm already in love with anything that has to do with Chicago. And um, because Wild Women in, in the Blues is set in 1920s Chicago. But then I was thinking uh, something came to my mind about um, from my mother, frankly, my late mother had a Mustang in, in, in the 70s. And I, I remember it was an old Mustang, but she kept it up. But the thing about the car that always stuck in my mind is we were not allowed 
the children were not allowed in the Mustang. We had to go. Absolutely not. <laughs> like, My dad had a car like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not. you know, you know how that goes <laughs> with parents and things like that. So I said, oh my God. And it was a 1968 Mustang. So I said, I'm going to write a book, my dual tour timeline love affair. With I have a love affair with dual timelines right now. And so 1928, 1968 became the years, the markers. Um, and there's a certain amount of mystery, um, definitely in the story. Uh, the first line of the book um, gives you a, a, a big hint because I think the first line, I'm going to read the first line just, yeah, because it doesn't funny. give away everything. But <laughs> I'm going to read the first line. The first line is, the night Veronica Fontaine died, there was a blackbird in the sky with a red and yellow triangle on its breast. It squawked like a crow, no song in its throat, just a curse, a string of damnations blasting my eardrum. Okay, I read the whole paragraph. But um, <laughs> my point being is that there's a mystery because Veronica Fontaine, um, as we know from the first line, is dead. Um, <laughs> but she died in 1928. So that storyline merges with what is a multi-generational character-driven story. Um, you really, I, I really wanted to dig into these characters and put them in um, a place in history that the backdrop of history is just as influential to their day-to-day -day lives because it really is about their their day-to-day -day lives and their day-to-day -day challenges from a 1928 chambermaid who wants to become a journalist who has to, who's committed to her family first and, and, and has a very sick mother, a, a very overworked father and a very rambunctious younger sister. And then 40 years later, she is um, the aunt estranged to her entire family who happens to be in Chicago when her niece needs a ride because she's trying to get away from her abusive husband. So these two stories come together. These two women come together in different points in their lives and they support and end up helping each other um, in different ways. I don't wanna give away too much. But um, I definitely enjoy juxtapositioning those two time frames because in 1928, just for some background, um, the Hotel Somerville opened in June. A week after it opened, uh, the, um, the NAACP held its first West Coast annual meeting in the hotel. So you had W.E.B. Du Bois, you had Char Charlotta Bass, you had a lot of the prominent um, civil rights activists from across the nation in this hotel a week after it opens. And my chambermaid, um, part of what she's about is she she has a you know a, a crush on W.E.B. Du Bois. His the crisis magazine is is just like her heart when it comes to reading. And um, so the opportunity to interact with him is very important to her. But she also has some other things going on that um, she's in the heart of, of what you might call gossips, a gossipy place, because everything happens in a hotel, at the bar, in the lobby, you know, just <laughs> all sorts of stuff. And then in 1968, they jump in a car because they got to get out of Chicago and head to Los Angeles. And um, things happen on Route 66 in 1968 um, that contribute to definitely bringing out different aspects of these two women because by 1968, Daisy Washington from 1928 is almost 60 and, um, and her niece, is in her early 20s. And it's just, um, I enjoyed writing a mature, um, a six-year-old woman who who has a lot of gumption 
and um, a lot of sass and a lot of style. But she's also, you know, looking to get some, take care of some business. <laughs> yeah. I'll put it like that. Perfect mix, <laughs> the perfect mix. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many have heard of a lot of the pioneers of black Hollywood actors, such as Hattie McDaniel, Paul Robson, Butterfield, you know, Dorothy Dandridge. What major obstacles do you think black actors face in the 1920s and 30s? And how do these challenges compare to what's happening in Hollywood today? Well, um, limitation of roles. I, I, well, let me start with 1928. Uh, in my story, I uh, King the Door, who is one... Um, um, he's not African-American, of course, but King Vidor was a major producer, director for decades. But one of his early films, he was the first filmmaker in Hollywood to make a film. It was called Hallelujah that had an all black cast. Um, the thing about black Hollywood back in those days, the major star uh, in the late 1920s was a man by the name of Stepan Fetchett. And he was a comedian, but his uh, portrayal, the, the character that brought him fame was quite derogatory toward the African-American because he was slow-witted, slow speaking, um, and did all of these things that were really super negatives that were expected um, portrayals of, of, of black males uh, by white audiences. So nonetheless, he became the first multimillionaire in that uh, area, you know, in, in, as an actor from that decade, from late 20s on. Um, Black Hollywood at that time was really supporting the um, limited characterizations that existed for of African-American people during that time period. So maids, butlers, um, I mean, you can, even though you, you think of Gone with the Wind, which was made in 36, I'm talking about eight years earlier, and Gone with the Wind, even though Hattie McDaniel may have won an Oscar for her portrayal of, of the maid, or the servant in that movie, she was still playing a part that had had, uh, was essentially the only part a black actor or actress could get. By the time you get to the 40s is when you talk about Dorothy Dandridge and Dorothy Dandridge had faced a whole different um, obstacles. Now, some things that are happening recently in Hollywood, just like they're happening in publishing, is doors are opening for people of color, for women. Um, women are writing more stories that Hollywood is producing. Um, women directors are starting to move into the forefront, even though I believe the second woman uh, to win an Oscar just happened recently as a director. I'm not sure because I don't really watch the Oscars. Um, but there's definitely opportunities, more production companies. Viola Davis has a production company. Um, you know, many of the actresses, uh, regardless of their ethnicity, are buying property so that buying books, um, buying scripts, so that they can get in front of the camera and portray meteor roles because there's still that tendency in Hollywood um, that, that you can read about today where the white man, male actor is getting paid, you know, three times as much money as the actress and or the parts are so limited. You know, the women are never in the forefront or I sh and I won't say never because things are changing. Things are getting better, but there's still a road to go. There's still more work, not just for all actors and actresses of color, for black actors and for women. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in the face of the sun, and again, if anyone's interested in purchasing the book, click the button on the screen that says buy the book. Uh, 
Uh, this book is told through a dual storyline set in yeah. 1968 and 1928, two periods of enormous change and turmoil in America. When writing this, did you find a natural parallel between these two years, or did it take some more research to decide on these particular moments in time? Well, I think that, well, definitely there's always a lot of research involved um, in in any historical piece, in anything you write, you're you're digging through something. I don't care what time period it, it is. It can be, it can happen yesterday. You still have to know things <laughs> that have to be researched. Um, but with this story, there was one thing that's, I, I don't want to say one thing, but a thing that came to me that really um, cemented the two years or brought them together for me was that there was so much excitement in 1928 for change in the African-American community for change that government supported. Um, W.E. Du Bois and the NAACP, um, there was just a lot of enthusiasm in California uh, in particular, you know, there were the housing, there was fewer housing restrictions um, at the time. There, uh, there were still housing restrictions. Housing was an issue, but there were civil rights activists who were making inroads with the government, with the city officials. So there was a sense of future that was going to improve. In 1968, you come off of 64 when the Civil Rights Act of 64 was signed, and there was this feeling of momentum that was undercut dramatically by the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. And then the summer of 1968, you also had, um, you know, riots. You had uh, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. You had the Democratic Convention coming in August. My uh, road trip takes place the first week in June. So the parallels to me between the two time periods were the difference between hopefulness and hope taken away for, um, for a community for a nation because the Vietnam War was also very much in the forefront of what was ripping the country apart. So there were layers of things going on in the 60s that dramatically um, were, were dramatically a heart aching change was happening at every turn. So I really, looked at 1928 as a more optimistic time period. And part of my main character from 1928, her arc is, is that she comes from, there are some personal things that really tore her uh, relationship with her family apart. But at the same time, she was still gonna go out there and try to be an activist. And she just got broken down over the years. She, she'd get, things would go well, and things would start to fall apart. And, and that impacted her. And so by 1968, we have a woman who um, is, is in need of repair, uh, I would say, and a niece who is in need of repair and a road trip that has um, obstacles and also some healing opportunities. So that's that, those were definitely the things that I, I felt most strongly about the two time periods, the time period of great hope and a time period where hope had been snatched away recently. Mm -hmm. We did have a question come in that I will fold into this. Um, I'm sure you learned many things when you were writing this book. Was there anything in particular that, that stood out to you, something you weren't aware of? No, well, I'll tell you one thing that I was totally unaware of it, from 1928, and it has a little little bit of humor in it. Um, Step and Fetch It, okay, he was a comedian. You can go on YouTube and take a look at some of the things he's done, he did, um, because it's definitely there. But at that time period, there was um, Valentino, Rudolph Valentino had recently passed. And um, of course, he was the god of gorgeous for the late 1920s. I mean, people 
I, I think there's even something that says how many women, do, you know, committed suicide when he died. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, because he was just loved. And he was a silent, um, silent picture actor for the most part. Well, when he passed, he also left behind um, a lot of beautiful suits, cashmere suits. I mean, his wardrobe was sensational. Uh, Lincoln Perry, a.k.a. Step and Fetch it, bought his wardrobe and wore his clothes. As he says, a good suit should not go in the ground with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, oh, I don't even remember. Someone asked me about this recently. And unfortunately, or fortunately, or, you know, you write books and there are certain things you don't remember. You mean to put them in the book some kind of way. I can't remember if that story got in the book. I think it did. <laughs> but... Um, just as, as something, my, one of my characters, information my character collects. But I was just like, that's crazy pants. And uh, <laughs> it was just crazy pants. And because he was like spending money like crazy. Um, another thing that, um, actually it wasn't something I learned. It, I had an opportunity to use something I recall from listening to people when I was a kid um debate on whether or not Cassius Clay, aka Muhammad Ali, should have changed his name. There were people who were mad oh, <laughs> about that. And then whether or not he who who was the best boxer, Sonny Liston. So so and I don't I'm not a boxing fan. Of course I was a Muhammad Ali fan because you know, amazing man, amazing life. But I was able to incorporate a scene where he was the topic of discussion. And oh, and okay. I, I enjoyed writing that scene a whole lot. <laughs> and speaking of research, what was the most difficult part uh, of writing In the Face of the Sun? Probably, um, it, it you know, it was a story, um, the Hollywood part, I think it was 1968. And I'm thinking more so about um, Route 66. Route 66 does not exist anymore, the way, certainly not the way it existed in, um, you know, the 60s. And there were aspects of that route and telling that story and visualizing those spots that really took some extra research. Also, I've traveled a lot, so I've driven, I actually drove from Chicago to LA um, oh, wow. a few years ago, a lot of years ago, frankly. But I also have taken a train from Chicago to LA hmm. and flown into Chicago, LA a lot. Um, so having a feeling of the landscape and uh, was something that I really wanted to have people just being in a car because you know the the road trip is is a, such a common uh, family thing that yeah I, I doubt if you can talk to anyone since cars have been uh, on the road who hasn't had a family road trip and how and so there's a connection to that and in, in my uh, listening to the music, remembering the music, how important music was in the car, not, oh, not yeah. just games, but just what you were listening to. Um, be it. So it was fun researching cassettes, you know, um, mm -hmm. old time cassettes, what music was available on a cassette, a car, you know, cassette. Eight track, I think that's what eight track. It's I was gonna say yeah, that's an eight track. track. <laughs> um, and uh, what was available in what tunes were available, what songs and, and stuff like that. So that was that was fun, but that was some interesting research. What was this woman's taste? Because of course Daisy controlled the eight tracks and and, <laughs> and there's a surprise third person in the car that I just he's not on the um on back of it. I already said he, so that was the giveaway. Um so there's somebody who's the surprise. Uh, that comes at a certain point in the story who joins the traveling to <laughs> okay. that was fun too <laughs>
researching that. <laughs> now, the four there's four main characters in this novel, and they are women, and they're all experiencing different stages of grief, um, discovery, love, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. In what ways does the hotel Somerville serve as a metaphor for these things? Um, the hotel, um, because of its, that's a great question that I'm trying to think through how those things uh, really, well, for the younger character, Henrietta, uh, for her, it's a place of discovery. And that discovery is always in front of her. There's always some important person, but there's always some Hollywood star or starlet and from Nina Mae McKinney to Bessie Smith to, you know, blues singers, uh, actresses who are just, because the other big component that really played into this was the um, sound was just coming to Hollywood. And so sound films and, you know, the little shorts became an opportunity for African-Americans to do um, shorts that were entertainment, pure entertainment based, where you were looking at, um, you know, anybody from Count Basie's performance to uh, a dance team or whatever. So just having all of that to her stardom in front of her was a fun thing um, for her older sister, Daisy. It was the opportunity to be around the people, the civil rights activists, the newspaper people. Those were the important people for her and the opportunity to make her own money um, because jobs were so limited, even though she had almost finished college, um, she hadn't finished. And, and the job that you got as a college graduate back in that day as a woman was as a stenographer. So she, she was, so close, but still so far away. Um, so, and in, in, in 1968, my main character, she worked part-time in the summer at a library. Other than that, she was a kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, her perspective, her life perspective was really whatever her husband saw, did, or wanted. And, um, and, and, and that was a challenge. That was very challenging. And a piece of history didn't make it into the book, but I was fascinated by it. Um, women could not have credit cards until 1974. Right. And that blew my mind. <laughs> it explained a, a little Speak joke. Speak of injustices, okay. Right? <laughs> right? You know, come on now. But it explained why my mother married so many times. Um, <laughs> and I was like, why well, is she getting married? Yeah. She's got to do what um, she got to do. <laughs> yeah, she, she's working the system. Um, and, and, and she won't be mad at me because she's in heaven. <laughs> she oh, can't wow. say anything. She, she used to just uh, come at, she says, who are you writing about in your books? And I was like, nobody. <laughs> nobody, I'm just writing books. <laughs> <laughs> but my main character in this story, her name is Daisy. That was my mother's name. But this book oh. is not about my mother. I don't want her coming back after me. <laughs> right. Let it be noted. <laughs> Let it be noted. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I'd like to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please ask them now. Click the button on your screen that says ask a question and enter your questions there. And we'll get to them as soon as we're finished up our in conversation piece. Um, so many novels weave together themes of inter intergenerational drama, the enduring mm -hmm. love of family, and then of course triumph against adversity. These subjects, subjects are often explored in the work of African American authors. You have found a way to convey these in such an elegant way that really celebrates the person as an individual highlighting their identity instead of just being defined as outshone by the, their particular circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, my question for you is, how do you do it? How do you ensure that the focus is on each character and their experience, not just the injustices surrounding them? Well, um, an another great question. Um, 
that I've been asked before, and I'm trying to remember my response because it made sense. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing that I I like to I'm going to try to get it out and make sure it makes sense. Um, my main characters are the heroes of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and that is what I stick with in these stories. And the um, cultural issues play into who they are. Not necessarily, they're, they're not always attacking or in, immersed. The story is not usually in, about the civil rights movement. It's not about, like the book I'm working on now is that set in the 19th century in West Africa and Britain. The backdrop is colonialism, uh, mm -hmm. slavery, um, Britain's Queen Victoria's court, a whole bunch of other stuff. Nonetheless, all of these things are in play, but the story is about the people and how the people, with all of these things happening, how they grow and change and transform and face personal problems as well as issues of the day. So that's just a a way of saying storytelling um, is crafted by the author as to what, what they want to deliver. Uh, I think that in some cases, the expectation of audiences or readers are that every book written by an African American is going to be 12 years as a slave. No, mm -hmm. there are too many stories and African Americans are first and foremost human people. So people problems, people challenges are stories that are to be told. And, and in addition, there are also some untold histories that are finally getting an opportunity to get out there by, by authors of color, by African-American authors, by African authors, by black authors worldwide who are telling their stories and getting their stories public. So, that is just a part of broadening the spectrum of storytelling that is an opportunity for all readers. If you're willing to read it, it's there for you. So I find this time period as it continues to move forward um, to be very exciting for readers. There's just so much to, to appreciate and enjoy and learn. Absolutely. All right. So the Hotel Somerville eventually became the Dunbar House, which is a cornerstone yeah. of Los Angeles jazz scene from the 1920s through the 40s. Right. What is the role of music in the novel's 1928 storyline versus the 1968 storyline? Well, um, the music is important to um, two of the characters, Isaiah and Henrietta. And um, the scene is still the jazz scene. The scene is still, um, the, there is a difference in some of the sounds on the West Coast versus Chicago versus LA. I don't dive into that a lot, but there's still that sound. I also, there, you know, there's also the folks who weren't involved in the jazz age. They might, um, I, I have a scene in there, I think where, there's a stand-up piano that's a part of the house where uh, the folks live on Naomi Avenue in 1928. And so they're playing, um, oh my gosh, I'm, not, I'm forgetting the guy's name. Um, I, it's, it's a movie. <laughs> when I say it, people are going to know. It's the movie with... Um, Robert Redford and um, uh, and um, where he was um, sort of a con guy, but the music became very popular about 40 years ago for a short period of time. And he was a mm -hmm. piano player. And I'm going to look it up while I'm talking. Oh my, I, I, I know. I'm like, I got to look this up. Oh my God. I, I can't believe I don't remember 
his name, piano uh, composer from the 1920s, Scott Joplin. Thank you. Scott Joplin is who I'm talking about. And so, it, and he was turn of the century. He wasn't even the 1920s. He was more turn of the century, but there were still folks who didn't listen to jazz, who didn't have any tolerance for it, um, regardless of their background and culture. So I, mm -hmm. I, play, I was able to introduce that sound. In the 1960s, you have a spectrum of music because you have the Beatles, you had um, R&B, rhythm and blues, what was a different style from jazz or blues, most definitely, but that became more and more um, popular because of radio playing, you know, black radio stations and things like that. Also eight tracks. Um, there's an artist that um, was popular back in that time named Laura Nero. She was um, a white folk singer more so, but she was a songwriter. She wrote a lot of the songs for um, groups like the Supreme and, and other, um, there are some other groups. That I, I mean, I'm a music person. I love music. I love classic music. Um, I'll be digging deeply into the 1950s, 1940s, and 50s music scene. Um, I'll be. I'm with my co-author Eliza Knight, and I are writing a book called "They Were Friends: A Story of Ella Fitzgerald and Marilyn Monroe." Um, and. Then another book I'm working on will be going back to the 1920s in New York and the jazz scene in, in Harlem, um, Harlem Renaissance period in the 1920s. Um, it'll be a part of the story because music was just so so much a part of the community. And um, it, it, if you're telling a story, you gotta you gotta touch. What are people listening to? And and I also find. Um, Paying attention to music, no matter what time period I'm writing in, really gives you a sense of character. Uh, what do they like? What do they like to listen to? In, uh, for example, the 19th century book I'm working on, Queen Victoria's favorite composer was Mendelssohn. And um, in fact, Mendelssohn's, one of Mendelssohn's tunes became, um, was played for the first time at the wedding of uh, the royal um, uh, Royal Princess Victoria, her daughter, her oldest daughter, and it became what we hear now as the wedding march. Um, oh, that wow. is uh, across, yeah, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I read someplace once that, you know, if you want to travel through time, um, pay attention to the music. Mm -hmm. uh, just search music and you'll find. Uh, everything you know, you can go way, way back, and somebody's doing something with sound, um, mm -hmm. and so that's one thing I, I I enjoyed. Well, songs are such touchstones, aren't they? Like going back to thinking about the music while they're driving in their car. I can think of songs off the top of my head that take me right back to a summer bar to the moment. Take me, you know what I mean? Like it yes. really, they're they're touchstones for a lot yeah. of us, I think. Right. Well, one of my use that was fun was uh, Martha and Vandela's Heat Wave, um, yeah. which is, you know, straight up Motown from back in the day. But that was fun to have, have that song ha have a role um, in, in, in the storytelling. Um, in my first book that you see on the right side here, uh, Wild Women in the Blues, um, music was definitely um, a strong part of that story. I mean, my main character in the 1920s storyline was a chorus girl who worked at a um, um, a, a, cap, a cafe, a cabaret in Chicago. But one thing as part of my research process that music can also help you with is the language of the time. Um, how people, you know, imagined Things. I mean, if you think about some of the Beatles songs and some of the lyrics, if you think about R&B tunes, some of the yeah. lyrics, if you think about the blues tunes, I listened to a lot of blues and jazz uh, recordings from the 1920s and the style and the energy of the lyrics and how the female blues singers, you know, 
did their thing. Um, told you a lot about um, speech patterns and thought patterns and things like that, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, we do have another question here. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. <laughs> um, what do you think Daisy would make of Los Angeles and Chicago in 2022? Uh, she would still be having a blast in, both cities offer something different for her. I think in 2022, um, 1920s Chicago, um, the gal from the 1920s Los Angeles in Chicago or in Los Angeles, she would have been very excited about her opportunities as a reporter. Mm. Um, but she'd have to approach reporting a little bit differently. Um, oh, oh, I guess somebody sent me a note about this event. Okay. But I'm here. Um, no, I just got a flash that somebody yeah. said, I'm on the call. Sorry about that, folks. But anyway, um, I think she'd be excited, but challenged because um, I was a journalism, um, um, worked on my master's in journalism, didn't finish it. But journalism is very different today because of the distribution handles, be it internet, delivery, how news is digested. So she'd have a, she, since she was also a gossip columnist of sorts in the story, you'll find that out for those who grab hold of In the Face of the Sun, she, she was at the center of the action. So she ends up in In the Face of the Sun helping out a reporter who's a gossip columnist. So she becomes his eyes and ears in a way. Um, but she'd have a good time doing that uh frankie on the other side in 2022 um I, I think that she'd be happily she'd find a way to be happily married um and also doing something she really enjoyed which would probably be working at a library in um a, a capacity of building or bringing in uh old books Mm. and 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 keep, keeping those in front of people i th i yeah they, they'd be they'd be able to to have the best of all the worlds that they were denied i would mm. think i mm. uh, you know they'd go for it yeah. they they'd strive for it with confidence so I understand you are also you review books for NPR, which is amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would love to know what your current TBR pile looks like. Oh, please, <laughs> that is madness. <laughs> that know. is madness. Um, we get it. We get it. <laughs> oh my God, there's so much happening right oh. now. Uh, let me just mention some of the books that I'm looking forward to. I'm going to start with, and I don't have them in front of me. Usually, I have a pile of books. I have some behind me. But they're, <laughs> but they're really everywhere. It's it's like their books are in every room of my house, but and stacks, not just one or two. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I am a, a looking forward to uh, reading Sister Mother Warrior that's coming out in July by Vanessa Riley. Mm -hmm. I am looking forward to reading. Uh, now, I actually, I'm going to listen to it in, in a road trip this weekend. The Mayfair Bookshop by Eliza Knight, who is my co-author on, on the Ella Fitzgerald Marilyn Monroe book. Um, very excited about reading um, The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. Um, the Emma Project by Sonali Dev is coming soon. I get some of these books early. That's why I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I that's know. the beauty of it but oh i know we've got piles all over the house all well over this one is out this is another vanessa riley book mm, called mm -hmm. island queen this is a lovely book I love that cover too oh, oh it's gorgeous oh. this is an older book but still one of my favorites by um oh, tracy yes. chevalier called you know, and I've i did and i reviewed one, this yeah. for npr a couple of years oh. ago and loved it it's called a single thread um, another book that I reviewed at NPR, I have a whole bunch that may be coming. I'm waiting to get my assignments. 
But um, this mm. fabulous mm -hmm. book, The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. I just have to show it this way. 800 pages, every word is golden. Wow. Um, what else can I recommend? There are just so many fabulous books um, that, let me think, let me think, because I'm just looking around the room <laughs> trying to spot. Oh, I'm, I'm always in love with um, um, ooh, uh, The Seven Husbands of, oh, uh, 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 um, you know what I'm going to say. Yes. Seven husbands. We all see around around the house. We just call it seven husbands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Evelyn Hugo. That's right. That's it. Yeah, seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Um, in, in, in indeed, um, I'm pretty much uh, a fan of her work. Um, there's a book coming soon, and I'm gonna uh, by Chanel Treaton, and I'm gonna get to speak with her. Um, she's a part, I'm going to participate in her book launch. It's called The Last Days of Barcelona, coming yeah. out, I believe, May 29th or, yeah. or you know, towards the end of May. Um, yeah, I, but I love book, Chanel's I books, mm -hmm. absolutely, and, and features Williams. Oh, um, mm -hmm. gal by the name of Piper Hughley has a book coming out next month, uh, and it is fabulous. It's called By Her Own Design. It's a novel of Anne Lowe, fashion designer to the social register. Anne Lowe's um, claim to fame is that she was the fashion, she designed Jackie Kennedy's, well, Jackie Bouvier, her dress in 1953. And, um, but she had a a, you know, a decade long career in the fashion industry, but she sort of disappeared. You know, how that happens mm -hmm. with um, those African American achievers of past history. Sometimes history doesn't keep track of them. Um, and um, so Piper is, has written a lovely, inspiring book about Anne Love that will be out next month. Um, I could go on and on. <laughs> One of the things about, you know, um, having the opportunity to write book reviews and or blurbs, I've also written book reviews or blurb book reviews for Book of the Month Club and some other um, entities. And um, I'm not a fast reader. I, I kind of just dig in and, and want to really cherish the words. Uh, um, so I don't do a lot of book reviews, especially right now because I have several WI works in progress that um, are, you know, have my attention because of, of contracts and deadlines. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't see any more questions that have come in, so I would like to thank you so much for joining us. Thank I truly, you. I really enjoyed the conversation. I cannot wait to get into this this weekend. I'm I, so I hope you enjoy it. it. I'm yeah. sure I will. I'm sure I will. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you everyone for watching and everyone take care. Thank you.